I did this for like getting on for nine years, eight years. And um, it, it just I basically was having a breakdown. Um, it was causing problems in all my relationships, not just my home relationships, my work relationships, my friend relationships, because I was just completely stressed and completely breaking down and completely trying to keep the business going and making. And, and, and I by this time, I was so involved in everything. I couldn't see that I needed to get out of it. I would, I, I would, you know, if clients needed to be called back rather than the staff I had paid to call them back, I would do it myself. Rather than put the Facebook pictures on Facebook that, that were taken, I would take the pictures and put them on Facebook. So I, I, I got myself really involved in everything and thought that if I stopped, it would just completely come crashing down. And as a result, I came crashing down. Firm of figures knows your money cuts down on strife. Time to trust your future. Firm of figures love your life. The Firmer Figures Business Show is brought to you by Financial Gym Studios. Welcome to the only gym where someone else does the working out for you. Where you get impartial tips and strategies in plain English to help you understand your money, love your business, and trust your future. Introducing your host, author, speaker, and creator of Firmer Figures, the cantankerous coach, Georgette Roland Osborne. Is this you? You've been in business for years, but your personal situation is just not improving. No matter how much you earn or you take home, you cannot seem to accumulate enough cash to reduce your financial stress. Well, introducing the How to Build a Buffer of Personal Money and Stay Out of Debt checklist. It's a quick start system that will help you reduce debt, increase savings, protect your future and enjoy yourself today without monthly boring budgeting. What you get is a one-page checklist that shows you the steps that you need to take to change your situation forever. And if you get the checklist, you also get access to a free mini course that takes you a little deeper. And it's, this is for you. If you are in debt, you're just covering expenses, maybe you're ticking along. Or you're getting used to having more money coming in than you are normally accustomed to. And you can do this system even if your earnings stay the same each month or fluctuate. Isn't it time you paid yourself first? Go get your checklist at financialgymforbusiness.com slash PM checklist. That's P for Papa, M for Mike, checklist. See you there. OK, let's get on with the show. If you're determined to make a real dent in the world, but you've been on a bit of a roller coaster in your life and it has threatened to derail you, my guest today is someone you definitely need to listen to. He's going to give you some great insights into how things can be so much better if you just know where to look. I find Paul a wonderful blend of strength and determination because he's got a vulnerable side that he is not afraid to expose. And if it helps others to better themselves, even better. He's a coach, mentor, teacher, author and speaker. And he's been those for almost three decades. He's embraced change and reinvention ever since injury caused the end of his professional football career. A lifelong student first, Paul has coached many thousands of people in health, strength, wellness, mindset and performance, both face to face and online, and built many different businesses along the way. The concept of Paul's teachings aren't that you need to look externally for that one elusive tactic or hack that's going to make all the difference, but how to look internally and remove the reasons that you aren't living the life that you desire. As a species, Paul says we have used stories for our protection and survival forever. Unfortunately, most of the stories we listen to subconsciously on a day-to-day -day basis don't service but actually hinder our progress. For me, I find that he has a way of making you feel that you can lean on him. He's not just mentally fit, but he's physically got it going on. Please welcome my super fit friend, and today's thought leader, Paul Webb. Hi, Paul. Welcome to Hi. the show. <laughs> Thanks very much. I, I, I hope I can live up to that amazing intro. Oh, no problem with that. Me. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, the whole point is for you to relax and for the 
the audience, you know, all three of them, to um, get to know you a little better. So I'm going to ask okay. you a few little silly questions. Sure. Um, don't have to think too hard, just whatever comes to mind. The first one is, who would you like to play you in a movie if you could choose? Oh, well, I've been told, uh, I'm not going to tell you who by, that I am the white Eldris Elba, so... Uh, <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah, okay. So that, that'll do for You start. might be fitter than him, though, don't you think? Well, I don't know about that, but I'm quite happy with that. I can live with that, basically. No, no, I'd be, I'd be all right with that as well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what, car, what type of car are you? An executive saloon, sports car, or a 4 by 4 Oh, that's a tricky one. Do you know, um, four by four. Okay. Yeah. All right. See, very male. Mm. Which famous person do you have a secret or maybe not so secret crush on? And he hasn't got to be a romantic crush. Just you're into them. <sighs> male or female. We don't mind. Mm-hmm. Probably secret if it's a male. I, I have a very unhealthy... Um, well, actually, do you know what? I have a really unhealthy obsession uh, about Death in Paradise. Do you know the TV you, program? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I am absolutely obsessed with that program. Don't know why, I love it. Okay. Uh, so Dwayne from uh, um, Death in Paradise, I have a big man crush on. Do you know, Paul, I, I, I can safely say I didn't see that one coming. No, 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 no really. I, I actually really like Death in Paradise is one of the night time, get in from an event or something and it's on. Yeah. And you just yeah. go to sleep with a smile on your face. So, That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I get it. Dead or alive, what two people would you most love to meet? Oh, um, Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Dalai Lama. Okay. He's come up a bit um, on this show, actually. What in your life do you keep meaning to do but never seem to get around to? Jump in a Winnie Bay, go and travel across America. Oh, okay. A, ser- a, a serious wish. Yeah, the, yeah. The, I just get a, a huge RV um, with all the, the trimmings and then I just, just disappear off the grid for three months. Oh, I can imagine. With me, we've just been no cooking and no washing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, and last but not least, not including Richard Branson. Right. Who do you most admire in business right now? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, there are so many different people. Uh, some probably you you won't have heard of. Some you would have heard of. Let's look at. Some you would have heard of. Uh, Elon Musk. Okay. What would you like about him? I like the fact that he sold PayPal and then invested all that money. Mm -hmm. He could have sat back for the rest of his life on an island somewhere and not done anything. And he chanced and invested all that money in two companies, Tesla and SpaceX. And he left himself so short of cash that he had to borrow money to pay his rent <laughs> while he built those businesses up. Now, that is someone that isn't afraid to take a chance. Mm. That's, that's true entrepreneurial. It is. And, I, and, I, and, and, you know, I don't know the guy. He may be the, the, he may be an awful person, mm. really. But just that about him just tells me volumes about what he wants to try and do and, and what he's trying to do with these businesses as well. Mm. OK. So let's go back in time in terms of your business life. What did you do as a before you sort of went into the world of working for yourself? What would, what was your last job where you, if you ever had a real uh, job? Well, you... I, I was a professional footballer, so uh, whether you'd class that as a real job, I don't know. And uh, um, it's all I wanted to do. Uh, I come, I'm, I'm a seventies child, so I was brought up before phones and computers and video games and. And all that sort of shenanigans. So, and we were allowed out to play from dawn till dusk. It didn't really matter so much. Um, so all we did was play football. So at that time, that's all I wanted to do. And who, who did you play for? I ended up playing for Crystal Palace in Fulham. Um, the Chris, Crystal Palace was the main club, mm-hmm. and it was where I got injured. Um, and I had to take two years out to try and come back from the injury. And by that time, I mean football is, was still is to a degree, but was back then so so harsh. Um, got injured. My contract ran out while I was injured, and I was released by Palace. 
So there was no um, thank you, goodbye, or anything like that. It was just mm-hmm. we're not renewing your contract. So I got myself as fit as I could, and then I went and did a pre-season with Fulham, played a couple of games for them. But the injury kept flaring up, so so that was that. And I kind of find myself, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. I had no idea what I wanted to do. My whole life had been directed towards the football. Um, I kind of put all my eggs in that basket, and, and it had been taken away from me, effectively. Mm-hmm. Um and so I tried a couple of jobs. I did a, uh, some sales jobs, some marketing jobs that um, I knew people in those areas and they'd, they'd got me work and, and I just didn't gel with me. It was a stirring in me to do something different. And I, I still felt unfulfilled because I hadn't, I guess, fulfilled my athletic potential. Back then, so we're talking about the late 80s, um, in, in football terms, there weren't things. I was a goalkeeper. There weren't specific goalkeeping coaches back then. So that wasn't an option for me. Um, but I loved training. I loved the gym. So I kind of just reinvented myself as a, well, at first of all, as a strength and conditioning coach because um, I was obsessed with strength. I, I loved um, um, all the Olympics with the weightlifting. I loved um, World's Strongest Man. My cousin at the time was British powerlifting champion. So I was obsessed with strength. Um, and I knew that America was where I had to be at. Mm. Um, there were no real strength gyms in the UK. There were no strength coaches in the UK. So America it was I went to to learn how to, uh, you know, teach people how to become stronger and more explosive in relation to their sport. And, you know, when I came back to the UK and tried to set up a business, there, there just was no takers for it. No one wanted to do it. So I learned very quickly that if I wanted to earn money, I had to do something else. So I just set up personal training uh, systems and and, and facilities to be able to train people for all sorts of reasons. Now, back then, it wasn't really so much you were training them for fat loss. That didn't really come around till later. But most people wanted to move a little bit better, feel a little bit better, get, build a little bit of muscle and that kind of thing. And that's how I started. I just started very, very slowly and, and kind of fell into it more than anything else. It's interesting, actually, because I can't remember when fat loss was never a, a big deal. Isn't that really weird to imagine that there was a time it was... <coughs> It didn't. It wasn't the most important reason for people to train. Well, people never came to the gym specifically to lose fat. Um, people came to the gym to get fitter. Mm-hmm. People came to the gym to build muscle, um, and that, that and to get stronger. Um, it, was it all very male then? It was more male than female, mm-hmm. uh, especially on the strength side. Um, it's changing a lot now. Uh, a lot. It's uh, it's really shifting, but but predominantly it was male. Um, the f- people didn't go to the gym at, 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 as a hobby you know people didn't go to the gym as a habit mm. the people used to go to the gym for a specific reason I, 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 I'm a bit slim I want to build some muscle I go to the gym you know nowadays health and fitness is so entrenched into culture that you can't open your Facebook feed without seeing multiple posts about it or look on Instagram without pictures of someone showing you their food but it never used to be like that the gym was very underground. It was very, um, as you say, mal-dominated at, at that particular time. And, and it was done for a reason. And then people left. They, there was no long-term memberships or okay. anything like that. Mm-hmm. And so how did it go then as a, as a business? Was it just sort of you making some money doing training? Or did you see it as sort of a long-term thing that you could expand on? Uh, if I'm completely honest with you, I ran it as a hobby, first of all, mm-hmm. um, because I didn't want to do anything else. And it was it was a... Um, I'm going to say easy way, but it's never easy because obviously you, you're putting yourself out there and, and trying to build a business based on what you can do for people. So you have to put the work in and get the results, of course. But but it was an easy business to do because I was so passionate about it and and I was good at it. You know, I could I could motivate people to come and train. I could give them good workouts. I could get them results. So um, it, it kind of crossed many balls you know it, it, it was many things to me at that time and they all made sense and I never really thought about it as a long long-term business mm-hmm. but kind of now I was young I was enthusiastic I just wanted to earn some money and have some fun if I'm completely honest with you one of the reasons I set it up was because at the time all my friends and I were going on holiday and they all wanted to get in shape <laughs> so we got them all in the gym and <laughs> we away we went and that's how it kind of built really that was the impetus to really get going it's funny actually because I, I wrote a little line in. Um, I'm doing my next book at the moment. I wrote a little line in there, you know, saying, "Yeah, give the real reason why you want to sort your money out." Yeah. And blah blah blah. The real reason, the reason you tell people, you know. And for example, the main reason I was known that most young men go in the gym is not to get fit, yeah. is to get girls. 
<laughs> and that was it. So as you say that, I remember thinking that that's exactly that was... what it is—the real reason. But that's not the reason they tell you. Mm. Yeah, that, no. We, clients never have usually give you the real reasons. First of all, it, there's a process of unraveling the onion, so to speak. Mm. You know, peeling back the layers and and, and getting to the real reason that, that people want to do things. And uh, there, you know, I'm sure that at some point in the next few minutes we'll cover that. But but definitely the real reason was just to get in shape so we impressed the girls on you know when we were away. That was it. And and I thought to myself, oh, I really enjoy this. I really like this. I can do something with this. Mm. So how did the business evolve? I mean, around the time I first met you or, or knew of you, um, the business was sort of, it, in, in my mind, you know, told me differently, what it, it had reached, it had arrived. It was the thing that you had in, envisaged yeah. and it was going. So to give, give us the story of from basically a hobby to creating what was, a, you know, a proper business. Well, um, the hobby kept me going for a long time. Um, it enabled me to, you know, to earn money. Uh, and, you know, when you're young, you don't need a lot of money. I was living with my dad at the time, so, you know, expenses were quite low, and, and I was able to, to um, you know, just train the people I wanted to train, earn the money I wanted to earn, and then do the things I wanted to do. And there come a point, um, and I have to give my, my wife credit for this, because when I met her years ago, um, she had health concerns, and her health concerns meant, as the doctor had told her, that she wouldn't be able to have children. And so as we, our relationship became more serious, she said to me, look, I need to tell you, that blah, blah, I can't have children, and I uh, just want you to know if that's a problem, then I understand. And I was like, that's not a problem. Tell me what, what the issue is. And she told me what the issue is, and uh, I said to her, you know, that's a hormonal issue. Um, we... <sighs> It's just a, it's just an imbalance in your endocrine system. We can make that better. I'm not saying you'll be able to have kids, but we can certainly make you feel better. We can certainly get you sleeping better. You know, we can certainly get your hair thicker and more luscious and your skin better and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's quite simple. Don't confuse simple with easy, though, because whenever we try and do something and there's a process, it's about that consistency of doing the thing every day. Right. So it may be simple when you look at it, but in actuality, the doing of it becomes difficult. So I said to Lee, you know, you, you have to do this on a day to day basis. This isn't something you just do and then you do it for a week and then it's fine. This is a lifelong thing. So Lee's um, put these steps into place. We had to change it a little bit because obviously the human body is quite funny about certain things and there are always surprises that are thrown up. But, you know, in a, in a six months or so, we were starting to get some really good results. She felt better. She was sleeping better. Her cycle, her menstrual cycle got better and more regular and she'd never had a regular cycle. So all these hormonal things started to work that much better. Um, and then she fell pregnant. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, which, which is what the doctor said, effectively, uh, words to that effect. And um, um, we actually ended up having two children. And um, it, it really was just that thing of making sure that you get healthy. If you give the body the raw materials to get healthy, the body will get healthy. It knows what it's got to do. It's had eons to work it out, right? So, so just give it the raw materials, and that's all we did. So Lisa said to me 15, 20 years ago, you've got to do this properly. This is really, really important. Yeah. To, rather than play at this and do it when you feel like it, you've really got to do this as a full-time thing. So, I think, oh, God, 15 years ago or so, I set up the first proper gym and run the first proper business uh, as a business rather than a hobby, and then it went on from there. And then, obviously, it evolved as we went until I sold it about three years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember because you weren't far from me either. I remember thinking, oh, I must pop down there one day. But it was about the point in my life when going to the gym was like, because <laughs> I used to live in gyms, love them. And mm. then what the, well, is it? Seasons of life. Of course. Seasons of, course. of life, I think, is what it is. But yeah, I could well um, do to be back in one. I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> cannot tell a lie. <laughs> so you've set up the gym and it's, and it's doing its thing. What happens next in your journey? Well, um, I, I set up the business as a, a small training business. Um, so I had a, a an off high street unit, effectively a shop, um, and I set up the business in there as a one-to-one -one training studio. So it was a personal training studio. Um, it was the only personal training studio in the area. I, I did the usual, leafleted the area. Um, this was even prior to Facebook starting, really. So it was before social media, really. So it was all done the old fashioned way with direct marketing and, and mailing the local, um, area and ho having an open house kind of thing where 
people could come in and see the studio and speak to me. And I, I managed to build up a reasonable sized business doing it that way. But it got to a point uh, very quickly in about two and a half years of doing that where it, it, I was just so busy and I couldn't get any more people in because it was one to one training. So people were paying me a fixed rate to come in and work with me for an hour. Now, I did things like the, the, the usual kind of fitness things where you do a block booking. So you pay for 10, you get two extra or whatever um, um, to secure a bit more, uh, you know, guaranteed funds. And then I played a little bit with with other kind of ways of charging. So I run a membership for it, but it was too small for that, really. And then I started doing semi private where I'd have two people at once who may or may not know one another. But obviously the hourly rate went down a little bit from their perspective, but it meant I earned a little bit more and it meant I could get more people in. So I tried various things, but it became apparent very quickly that we'd outgrown the place. Um, and then um, we we actually we got married and. On our wedding day, my phone pinged and it was a guy I knew that was a landlord and had a, a shop, a, a double fronted shop on the high street. And it had just become available and he knew I was looking at getting somewhere bigger. So he said, do you want to come and have a look? Uh, and I remember it because it was on our wedding day. It was, it was just crazy. So um, <laughs> we went. The phone was uh, on on your wedding day, Paul. Well, but before I got married, yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say it was in oh, my okay. pocket because I, I got I just, married. I, I stopped to, the ceremony and just said, just take this call. Yeah, yeah, I needed to get that one out there. I'm just, just, just saying. No, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Just, carry on. I had said I do before I took the call. You're oh, right. oh, 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 it's a good thing, I think. Anyway, carry on. Um, so, you know, we, we did all the wedding stuff and, and then a, a week or so later we went and had a look at this place and um, it, it was massive. It was huge. Um and uh, we kind of just, yeah, we'll go for it and we'll, we'll try and build the business here. And that, that was like the second evolution of the business. Yeah. Um, and that it was an exciting seven, eight years we were there. Um, ups and lots of ups, lots and downs. Um, some mistakes I made at the beginning, but some things I got very right. Yeah. So how, how did you deal with the, the one to one or one to two? How did you did you manage to ever extract yourself out of being the person yeah. doing it all? Yeah. Or how well, did you overcome that? Uh, that's a really, really good question because no, I didn't is the answer in the long, long term. There were times when I tried desperately to, um, but um, I always found myself pulled back into it. So what I tried to do, you see, um, I, I made a, I'm going to be completely honest with you and transparent here. Okay, I made a couple of calamitous mistakes at the start of building that that bigger business. Okay, the two. Well, there are three mistakes I made, really. One was that I thought I could do it myself, right? that I could build the business from the ground up myself, not having built that big a business before, which involved staffing and all sorts of stuff. So rather than bring in someone that had experience with that and pay them to put that in place and then to put systems in place so that when we grew, the systems would work mm. and I wouldn't have to do it, I didn't do that. As I thought, to my, there were a couple of reasons. One, because I was egotistical enough to think that I knew best. <laughs> Two was because the, we had to rebuild the, 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 the shop um, uh, quite significantly because there were damp issues in the basement and it was leeching money. Uh, I can't tell you how much mm. it cost. It was can ridiculous. So I, I was trying to save as much money as I can, uh, as I could, you know, just so we had some money to pay bills whilst this build was going on. The build also took a lot longer than I was uh, told, which I wasn't happy with. But so, so that was one real big mistake. Um, the other one I, I alluded to was that I, I didn't put systems in place at the start. You know, um, I, I, I started, we opened the gym, I had everything written up, I, I had these grandiose ideas of how it was going to run, but I didn't have the people in place and the systems to run it. Mm -hmm. So I just did it myself. Now, at that time, I was keen, I was enthusiastic, it was new, I was in there 16 hours a day doing it all and loving it. After a couple of years of that, it got to a point where I was like, you know, this can't go on, <laughs> it really can't. But the problem there was that everyone that was in the gym and involved in it had got used to me being the delivery mechanism. So, for instance, if I hired coaches to d deliver the training programs, the clients wanted me to train them. They wanted me to write the programs. They wanted me to look at them nutritionally. They wanted me to do their hormonal stuff. So I was getting pulled back every time I tried to extract myself simply because I made a couple of mistakes right at the beginning mm -hmm. that if I'd have addressed at the beginning and taken advice rather than trying to say, no, I know what I'm doing. It's fine. I've already built a business. 
which when you look back was a completely different business, to be fair. Mm -hmm. um, this was a proper business and, and it needed to be treated as such. And I caught again, it was kind of me treating it like I know what I'm doing. I can do this. I'm intelligent. And it just in the end, it became too much. You eventually sold it. What? What was the preceding reason or the main reason, I should say? Well, there were a couple yeah. of reasons. One, one, I had a, a, a knee injury that, that, that I mean, I, I basically broke down um, is what it was. Um, I did this. I did this for like getting on for nine years, eight years. And um, it, it just I basically was having a breakdown. Um, it was causing problems in all my relationships, not just my home relationships, my work relationships, my friend relationships, because I was just completely stressed and completely breaking down and completely trying to keep the business going and making. And, and, and I by this time, I was so involved in everything. I couldn't see that I needed to get out of it. I would, I, I would you know, if clients needed to be called back rather than the staff I had paid to call them back, I would do it myself. Rather than put the Facebook pictures on Facebook that, that were taken, I would take the pictures and put them on Facebook. So I, I, I got myself really involved in everything and thought that if I stopped, it would just completely come crashing down. And as a result, I came crashing down. And um, I had a, a partial rupture of my uh, MCL in my knee. I needed three operations because after the first two, I went straight back to work. I was in work within three days. Yeah. And the surgeon the third time said, look, you know, if you don't take 12 weeks off of work and heal this knee, I'm not going to operate on it again. Mm -hmm. So I had to make a choice, right? So, and it just so happened that right at that time, my wife got offered a job that she really wanted to do. So she'd been working in the business as well, um, but she'd come out of her original industry, which is the re retail, fashion retail, um, a few years before. She got a chance to go back into that industry at a director level, and she really wanted to do that. Mm. And of course, if she'd gone back and doing that, that meant that she used to do the school runs and the things like that. So it became very, very difficult for us to both be at work full time. So I had this problem now. I'm off work. I've got 12 weeks off. I'm laying on the sofa. My wife wants to go to work. My kids are running around. And I'm oh, what am I going to do? And I, I, I mentioned it to someone who I uh, had a physio that ran a clinic in the, the building. And I said, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I, I really don't know. And. He said, can you give me a week? Let me have a thing and I may come up with some ideas for you. And he came back and said, what if I buy it off you? And then I'll, I'll run it. And I've, I, you've got staff, you've got, you know, we'll change it slightly. We'll take some aspects of what you've done. We'll put some new ideas in and then you can go and do your thing. So, so that's how it came about and that's what I did. And it, it kind of, in, in many ways, it broke my heart because it was my baby. Yeah, can you um, but it, it solved a lot of immediate issues. You know, mm. that, that, that became issues because I didn't uh, do the right thing in the beginning. Mm. So the business is gone. You've, you've managed to get what is um, a big source of stress in many ways, I guess, um, <laughs> off your shoulders. How do you transition from that into the coaching that you're doing now? Well, that's, that was uh, initially very difficult. So I, I guess um, life is all about... It's all about evolution, right, rather than revolution. We evolve, we change, well, hopefully we do. Um, and businesses do the same. So everything's ebbing and flowing throughout nature. And sometimes we resist that, and when we resist that, we get stress, and then that stress leads to things happening like me almost having a complete breakdown. But when we allow things to ebb and flow, things have a way of naturally evolving. Um, and one of the things I was doing in the business that was working really, really well was a lot of mindset coaching, because what was happening is that even though the explosion of gyms in the 90s and the 2000s and whatnot, and more and more people going to the gym and more and more people getting online and getting access to really good information about how to get into shape, how to diet, how to prepare meals and all this sort of thing, the information became overwhelming mm. all right um yet people were coming into the gym more overweight more dysfunctional than i'd ever seen them in the past so there was a gap all right there was a gap between what they had access to and what they were doing and in between that was this this discourse and so i thought that's where i need to be 
if I'm going to get results and continue to get results for these people, I have to narrow that gap. Mm. And the way we do that is through mindset coaching. It's, it's, an, it's, an, uh, it's not an information issue. It's an application issue. Why aren't these people doing what they need to do on a day-to-day basis when they've got all the information? Well, that's usually a mindset issue, and that's where I started to do it. So, so even before the gym went, I was involved in that kind of coaching. So after I'd done all my rehab, now my rehab took eight months in the end really? to get the knee, yeah, from from start from operation to when I was able to fully like run and jump and lift and twist and all that kind of stuff, and not have any pain or swelling. It took about eight months. So I just started, um, you know, people were approaching me, you know, can we talk? Can we do this? And and I just started talking to people very much like we're doing now. Um, and we started talking about their their life, their dreams, their hopes, and, and it evolved into a bit of mindset coaching. And I, I kind of thought, um, OK, I need to look at how I'm going to do this properly. I don't just want to say I am a mindset coach and not have any, you know, idea really of the, the structure I need to do. So I looked for um the best mindset coaches around found them did a couple of their qualifications a couple of their courses and then actually ended up working with them for a while um when in fact the last year i've been working with them so um we've been delivering all that all around the world but that's how it kind of started just by knowing that there was that gap so is the emphasis on the mindset side or the physical or or both uh, well, my coaching now very much, it's almost become um, like a trifecta, if you like. So, um, I don't know, mind, body, soul, you could say, or health, wealth, happiness, something like that. So, <laughs> so it, you know, it's that old Venn diagram thing, right, where you have these seemingly separate areas of your life, but actually they're all one and the same mm. because they're us. They're the self. So if you, if you get fitter and stronger and healthier, you become more alert, more, have more energy, so you become more productive at work, mm. right? So you can do more things with a better mindset and more clarity, giving you better financial results, for instance. And then you can give more energy to your relationships because you're not stressed so much. Uh, so it all uh, inter- interlocks and it all weaves in a really nice pattern. And that's kind of what I help people do now. Now, I might do that just in the physical realm. I might do that just in the self or the mindset realm, or I might do a straight business coaching realm. But Ultimately, I try and involve everything in it uh, uh, at all times. So, so what triggers people to come and talk to you? What what kind of things are you coming across now while people, particularly as I know you're very involved in entrepreneurial space as well. Mm. So what, what type of things are people actually approaching you for, even if they're the hidden reasons that you may know that they're not admitting to? But Well, they, they, they come for, they, they say many different things. Mm. They say many different things, and it might be um, from an entrepreneurial standpoint that they're not building the business they think they, they deserve, that they're not earning the income that they deserve, that they haven't got client retention, that their marketing isn't working, their sales funnels are, are, are not working. It could be any of that. But really, that's not the real issue. They're things. They're external things. The real reason people come and see me is because there's an internal dialogue going on that they're either aware of or they're unaware of. <laughs> You see, you, you mentioned it yourself on, on, on the opening about it's not about the hack. It's not about the next trick. It's not about the next secret. It's about internally, you know, to be successful in any area, we have to release the brakes that hold us where we, we break ourselves. We go through life with our foot on the accelerator and our foot on the brake at the same time. And, you know, in order to gain t- traction and move forward, we have to release the brakes. OK, and that's an inward journey. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do external work. That doesn't mean you don't sort out your sales funnels. It doesn't mean you don't do marketing. But what it does mean is you go inside and find those stories that hold you back. And then what you do is you deal with those stories and you change those stories. And it's usually a self-worth issue. I've come to you with the, you know, my funnel is not working. I'm not retaining clients and so on. What do I do first, Paul? You answer the question, what do you really want? Which is what goes back to what we were saying earlier about people giving mm. the real. But do people yeah. really know the, that, that how to answer that? Because Not if necessarily. Because they're giving yeah. themselves yeah. that story, okay. right. that's the story, isn't it? So well, I, how do they know? Would, well, you would tell me the story. Oh, okay. Right? And then I would go through a process, say something like, okay, why? So um, why? So if you say, uh, okay, why do you want more clients? Well, because uh, that will give me more money. Okay, why do you want more money? 
well, because then um, I can do this, that or the other. OK, why do you want to do that? And you just keep digging and mm-hmm. digging mm-hmm. and digging. And eventually, it, you know, it comes out. It, the, the real reason comes out. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean we're not going to look at the sales funnel. Mm-hmm. Like, why is this sales funnel not working? Why are you not attracting clients? Why are you not keeping clients? But also there's this thing is, um, you know, in business, what we tend to do is we tend to think a lot of, of three words, right? We tend to think of how, how are we going to do something? How are we going to fix a sales p- funnel? We tend to think of why, why we need a sales funnel, okay? And then we tend to think of who, who we are and who goes in the sales funnel. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the wrong way around, right? The first thing we need to think of is who, who are you, okay? Who are you really, right? Um, and then why, why do you do what you do? And why do you want to do that? Who's it going to affect? Why is it going to affect them? And then the how, how do we fix the sales funnel comes at the end. Mm. Because if you're transparent, if you're authentic, if you drop the mask that, that, that hides the real you, then people get to resonate with the real you and they're attracted to you. So the sales funnel doesn't become such an important thing because you have conversations with people at a real, real authentic level. And that's really powerful. Mm. Mm. You know, and that's when you make a real difference in people's lives, and that's when you build a real business. It's funny, it's been funny you say because it, it took me a while to learn that. Not even just about myself. I knew I knew that about myself anyway. Hence why I do what I do, but I never talked about it. But I was always very aware. And then it struck me that I'm not the only one. So money is such a tangible mm. thing, but everything around it is the are the intangibles. And once you get those, you know, I, I have customers who turn around and say, oh, I can't afford to do this anymore. I need to throw that out. And even though they're probably making six, seven figures, but we need to cut back here and cut back there. And I'll be thinking, oh, maybe that's me. And I'll be like, no, no, not you. Not you. Because we need the answers to the questions that basically people will say things to me because when you see someone's financial situation, good or bad, there are no secrets left. But mm. the, the, you might as well tell me all. So, yeah, and a lot of it links to personal as well. Mm. So, I'm I'm doing a program at the moment called Publicly Rich, Privately Poor, and it just fascinated me. And I realised actually, it's the same story I had over and over again. The same story mm. you told earlier. The things we never talk about because mm. we're embarrassed to say it, and and so on. So we come with the external. Well, I just want to make more money. But why mm. is it? And I've had answers like, well, because I'm tired of people thinking I'm never going to make it. And I'm going to show yeah. up. And it's hard to say that out loud. (laughs) It it is. And uh, we've all done it when we've tried to sell programs or products or services. And we've tried to tell people that we're the program, product or service that's going to make the real difference. And that we're perfect in every way and that they can't do without the program. And, And it's a lie. It really is. Because what we try and do is we try and show people that we're the only viable solution mm. to their problem. And that's just not true. Mm. We live in a world full of seven billion people. You know, there, there is more than one road to Judea or whatever the, the saying is. Right. So so once we get that out in the open, you know, then we can be a bit more truthful about people and say, you know what? Um, I've not always got the answers. I don't always have all the solutions. I don't always know what's right or what's wrong. Mm. But I know some stuff and I've had some success and I've had some failures and I can't guarantee that you're going to be a success or a failure. What I can guarantee is that if you understand that there's no magic pill, that you have to do the work and that you follow the process that has worked for other people to the letter, you will get a result. What that result is, I don't know because it depends how much of the work you do. And it really does boil down. And it's not me diverting responsibility from me away. It's just the way it has to be. Mm. You know, I can't take someone from zero to a million dollars income and then disappear and have them go back to zero. You know, people have to be able to do the work themselves. It's, It's just the way it is. They have to learn and then implement learn and then implement and along the way they'll have ups and downs because nature ebbs and flows it's just the way it is and you have to be honest and tell people that you can't dress it up and say yeah it's all going to be fine it's all going to work wonderfully you're never going to yeah you know you you talk to people about 
when you deal with relationships and stuff like that, you know, uh, I don't want to have any more stress in the relationship. I don't want to argue anymore. Well, you're probably going to argue. You're still going to argue. But instead of not talking for three weeks after, you'll probably be talking again in 10 minutes Mm, mm. because you'll have tools there to be able to say, okay, let's leave it at that and let's just be kind now. Mm, mm, mm. So for someone who, say, can't afford full-blown coaching or or your expertise, Mm -hmm. um, what's they're listening and they're saying, you know, that's me. One of those things resonated with them. What small step could they take today or tomorrow where they could start to see some results in the self talk <sighs> Nothing major, just even something the that fir- you might okay. give as a routine. All right. The first thing is accept that what you tell yourself on a day-to-day basis about not being good enough, not being strong enough, not being thin enough, not being pretty enough, not being rich enough, hmm. is just a story. It's just a story. And like every other story, there are many, many, many different stories. And you just have to accept that there's a story. Okay? And then what I would suggest you do, once you accept that there's a story going around, you become aware of your story. And the way you do that is you go out and you buy yourself a pad, a journal, and a pen. Right? You can spend 99p or you can spend £25. It doesn't really matter. And every day, twice a day, you write in that journal what thoughts are going through your mind. So you try and write the story down. So in the morning for five minutes, you write what's on your mind. And in the evening for five minutes, you write what's on your mind. And then after 10 or 14 days, you go back and you start going through that journal and you see the repeating stories. That is your story. Once you know your story and you're aware of that story, you can start to change that story. Mm. Because you just live on a perception of uh, a fact. You don't live on the fact, you know, because, you know, uh, I'm not I'm not thin or pretty enough to be rich. Well, <sighs> Oprah Winfrey, anyone <laughs> to have weight issues all her life mm. and is a billionaire. So, you know, the people are doing it. Mm. You might not be a billionaire, but you certainly can once you get over the story, can start putting yourself out there and saying it's it's just a story. So and funny, that, that's, you said that because I listed, think back to what your story is earlier, and it's it's an like you say it's it's an evolution. How do you think you've evolved as a as a man? What's different about you today that isn't the same Paul Webb, maybe even a few years ago, maybe when you were still running the the, the fitness business? I no longer lie to myself or other people. What does that mean? It means that when I was running the business, I um, lied about to myself about how well it was going at times. And there were times when we went very, very well. I'm not going to, you know, mm-hmm. there were times when we earned a lot of money. But there were also times when we did very, very badly. And I would hide that and cover that up. And when people said, how's it going? Yeah, fine. Absolutely brilliant. Mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Um, there's a phrase in Swahili called sour boner. And it doesn't translate exactly to English, but translates like we or I see you. And it members or the this Zulu really in origin of the Zulu tribe, when they greet, they say Sawabona. And what it means is that for this period of time we're together, you are the only person I'm interested in. Oh. We are now going to exchange energy. So if I say, so we've always, we've all been in that position where people have walked past us and we go, hey, how you doing? Mm. And if that person says, oh, actually not too well, we think, oh God, I mean, I've got to talk to him. Why did I ask? (laughs) Yeah, we've all done that, right? I've done it myself many times. (laughs) But when you practice sour bona, for instance, you allow that person the honor of describing exactly how they are. And then it's your duty to help them. I'm really sorry to help to hear that, how can I help? Mm. And you mean it. Mm. That's me today, as opposed to me earlier saying say everything's fine. It's what, what do they call it? Um, I use it a lot of the time, is when you would someone be present. Yeah, presence is very important. Yeah, and and I actually, um, and I don't take things personally, which are quite, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. <laughs> There's always yeah. a reason for something. But I do take not being present personally, if that makes sure. it sense. Yeah. Because yeah. I but, feel but, like but, I am but, present. Yeah. People can only give you what they've got. 
and everyone's yeah. got stories. Yeah, yes. And if people yes. aren't ready to be present, then we shouldn't hold that against them. We, well, in, even though the head knows that, and one of the things that where I've found my business life sort of cross more into coaching more on a personal level was I had to address my responses to someone not being present. Mm. And then thinking, well, where do I find the patience to try and understand better why they're not? I may not get the answers, but no. just to have the the compassion yeah. and, as I say, compassion the, is big. And, and the patience and mm. just to say, well, you know what? That's not about me anyway. No, you know, it's not. It ain't about no. you. <laughs> but it's and, difficult. You know, um, don't think I'm sitting here talking to you and I, I'm sitting on a, a, a mountain top in the Himalayas and I'm meditating <laughs> all day and everything's perfect because it really isn't like that. You know, it's, it, I am a complete student first and foremost and I'm a work in progress and I have lots of good days but I also have bad days. Um, but the good out, outweighs the bad and when I'm bad, I know I'm being bad, so I can make do the necessary <laughs> work to become good again. You know, so it's it's all about I'm 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 on this journey. I'm trying to get to a point where um, I inspire myself to do great things, and by me doing those great things, it inspires other people to see that me, just a, a working class lad from a South London council estate, is actually you know being vulnerable as a man. You know. Um, crying at TV programs when, when there's nature programs on the telly, because I do, right, has a healthier obsession, an unhealthy obsession with death in paradise, and, um, you know, uh, mm. and, and I do all that, you know, and, <laughs> and I can be like that. Mm. You know, I've been the tough guy, you know, I'm well aware of my capabilities from an athletic point of view, but I can be this vulnerable person who can really invest himself in other people's happiness and health and wealth and, and self, and I can be that 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 shoulder to cry on and i can cry on their shoulder as well and i'm fine with that mm. and that's kind of where i'm at and some people really resonate well with that but i get a lot of people saying well you know that's not really manly is it and i was really? like okay. yeah oh yeah oh. yeah you know and i define manly for me then do you know, you know? what paul as you just remind me i was having this conversation with um the other half the, and we were talking about in the first james bond film with um daniel craig the Casino Royale one, and there's a scene where he kills some bad guys, and the woman Vespa, so watches him literally. Like, I can't remember now. You know, throws a man over a, a staircase, you know, kills him with you know, cracks his neck with his fingers and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then in the next scene, she's crying in the shower, and he goes and sits in there and puts his jacket around her and puts his arms around her, and the contrast from the scene before mm -hmm. to that was one of the most sexy things. Yeah. And from my point of view, I don't, um, yeah. can't speak for other women, but <laughs> it was, I remember thinking, wow, whoever wrote that transition certainly understands human, especially females anyway, because there's this tough guy who you can see do all of that and it take, it's mercenary. And yet at the same time, that gentleness, and I thought that was so well written. I know it's James Bond and, you know, it's, it's not Shakespeare or anything, but it goes to show that people that do that write these things have to understand the, the, the psychology of the people that they're writing for absolutely because those things do resonate so i wouldn't listen mm. to them anyway paul you yeah. you carry on crying at um detective programs and lecture shows well anyway. yeah, yeah. lecture shows lecture shows it's david gets me every yeah, time yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what my one but mine's common little house on the prairie and they do reruns <sighs> on um a thingy uh -huh. but i cried at the happy bits <laughs> you know Finish. You know, when, when, um, oh, this is, I don't know, talk about being vulnerable. When David Tennant stopped being Doctor Who, oh, and me oh. into if I pulled my eyes <laughs> ah, out. Stop it! My wife was like, What are you doing? Where do you go? <laughs> okay, David, I must admit, after the replacement weren't much cop, so I, I, I don't. Doctor yeah. Who, let's be yeah. honest. Okay, yeah. then, yeah. David Tennant would be very pleased to hear that. <laughs> I'm sure. So. Well, I know we're taking up quite a bit of your time, but it, 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 it's really been quite wonderful speaking to you. So what is it you're looking forward to doing in in the future, whether inside your business or outside? What have you got planned that's going to make a big difference in either in your in your career or the career of others or just at all? Um, I, I have four children. Yeah, so, so I have two children that uh, live in Lincolnshire with their mother 
and then my wife and I have two children and um, I just want to leave them a legacy in which they say my dad made a difference yeah that's all yeah that's not mm. all though that's huge yeah because that's, yeah. that's big for me yeah, yeah. that's huge yeah you know yeah. and to, for them to know that, that that it's not that difficult to do and then to go out and leave their own legacy that's yeah. all and now's the time because we can it's much easier for us to show them the way down than it ever was for yeah. our for our parents so no great stuff Paul my favourite sign off is been emotional. Thank you it's been so great. much. <laughs> Thank I've you really enjoyed so it. So much. I look forward to it. in the next stretch of your journey. Maybe have you back and tell us what's been happening then and, yeah, and this time absolutely. what I might do is pin you down, do a bit of a session for us, you know what I mean? I can show you some stuff. Don't you worry about that, <laughs> No worries. Thank you very much. Thank very you ever so much. And what about you? Are you facing any issues in your business? Any financial or productivity issues, you are more than welcome to contact me and see if we can get you sorted out. Email me at feedback at firmafigures.com. For the links to any of the resources I've mentioned, go over to financialgymforbusiness.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find them in the show notes. If this was useful to you, please would you consider going over to iTunes if you're an Apple user or Stitcher if you're an Android user and give me a rate and review. I love bringing information to you and would really love to know if this is helping. Every five-star rating that I get not only tells me that I'm not just talking to myself, it also tells iTunes and Stitcher. That way, when people are searching for a show like mine, I'll show up. Full step-by-step instructions on how to do this can be found at my site, financialgymforbusiness.com slash podcast. And if you have a website, blog, podcast, or business that you want mentioned, leave the details and I'll give you a shout out. And if you don't want to have to remember when I'm on next, just click the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening in on so that you get notified. In fact, if you haven't done it already, why not do it now? Thank you so much for being here. Bye bye. Firma